All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are at week two of the ABCD ReproNIM course. We are delighted to have you join us again. Uh, this week, we are really excited to bring you content from the ABCD end of things about DEEP and from the ReproNIM end of things about Git and the basics of scripting. So you have hopefully watched already the lectures for this week. Wes Thompson gave the ABCD lecture on DEEP and unfortunately for us, but fortunately for him, he's currently hiking the Appalachian Trail. So joining us to represent the good folks from DEEP, we have Hauka Barch, Claire Palmer, and at some point, Chase Reuter is gonna pop up. We had a little technical prob problem from him. Um, so let's go ahead and introduce this team. Hauka, tell us about yourself. Yeah, I first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to see, you know, 60 people interested in deep. Uh, that's that's really great. Um, so I uh, I'm German, but I lived for 16 years in the States, and I was uh, lucky enough to be able to help with the setup of the ABCD study. So uh, lots of uh, uh, good, great friends there. I'm a scientist and uh, deepest kind of uh, child of mine I, I can't let go even though I'm not part of the uh, San Diego team anymore right now I'm uh, sitting in sunny Norway so good old Europe uh, hi everyone thank you Hauke um, for those of you who don't know Hauke was with ABCD from the very very beginning and he is very near and dear to so many of our hearts because he was so helpful in us in figuring out how things were actually going to work and, and getting started in those very early scary, scary days so it is lovely to see you Hauke. Uh, Claire tell us about yourself. Hi everyone. Um, so I am, you're from self by accident, I'm actually British, so I'm from London. Uh, did my PhD in Cognitive Neuroscience in uh, London at UCL. Um, and now I'm working as a postdoctoral researcher with Terry Jernigan, who is um, kind of director of ABCD and also Anders Dale, who's director of the Data Analysis and Informatics center, resources center. They, they always add an extra uh, letter in there. Um, so I am uh, working as part of the ABCD team within the kind of data side and also the coordinating center. And I've also been part of the deep development team as well. So hopefully I can answer as many questions as I can today. Excellent. We are very glad to have you, Claire. And we, we do have Chase here with us. So Chase, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Chase Reuter. I've been working with ABCD um, with Wes for a few years now. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a statistician at UC San Diego and um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So as you can see, you know, week to week, we may have some fill-ins for folks who aren't available and we're just delighted that yes, we, we did lose Wes this week, but we have three exciting fill-ins for him. So um, joining us also is our ReproNIM lecturer and that is Dorota. Dorota, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, sure, my name is Dorota and I work at MIT. I'm mostly working on scientific software and I'm part of ReproNIM uh, team with David and Jaroslav who are today. Excellent. Um, so the one thing that I wanted to mention before we really get started is that last Today is the last day for those of you um, to fill out the pre-course assessment. Uh, this one's really important to us. We want to be able to provide the NIH with metrics that our course was indeed successful. So we want to get some uh, survey questions from you before this course really gets started. And here we are at week two. So it's time to close that survey. Uh, in the Canvas portal, only 80% of you have completed that survey. And we would like to get that number to be as close to 100% as possible. So if you haven't done the survey, you have until midnight tonight, please go into Canvas. Um, you know, on the analytics end, it actually tells me it only takes you five and a half minutes to complete that survey. So please try to find five and a half minutes later today, go in, click on those answers. It's not graded for course credit. We just want to have your contributions from that assessment to reflect in our metrics moving forward. And uh, now I'm going to hand it over to David Kennedy. Hi, welcome to uh, week two. I don't really have an awful lot to add. I'm so uh, happy that uh, we have so many from the deep uh, development and uh, how does even before ABCD there was ping. Uh, ping showed up in my lecture a lot and the ping portal you know, was really a predecessor to the ABCD deep portal. So again, I'm 
you know, great to have him. And of course, uh, Dorota and the Reaper and him team are always well represented here, so it just uh, is great. So I don't think I have anything else to say uh, introductorily. Uh, I think I'll turn things over to uh, Dustin to give us some uh, updates from his end. Dustin, you're on mute. I am. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Dustin. I'm one of the teaching assistants, and I just wanted to give some updates about this week's um, or the, the quiz, week two quiz that went live on Friday of last week. So we appreciate all of the, the feedback on the quiz. And I wanted to clarify a couple of things. So we've realized that one of the questions has an issue with clarity and another question is incorrect. And so I wanted to point those out. Um, and we appreciate all the feedback. We're bound to make, make mistakes. And so please point out whenever something is unclear um, and we'll make sure to give proper credit for these, but also keep in mind that we're not grading the quizzes for correctness, only for completion. So also some of the answers, uh, specifically the shell questions, they, uh, the contents, the, the questions are contingent on the contents of the Unix user manuals, uh, grep and cat and LS and, uh, it was an oversight that, yeah, the contents of those manuals differ depending on operating system. And so the answers could differ depending on uh, what version of different operating systems or whether you're on Linux or Mac or Windows. Um, and so, yeah, those are definitely, uh, those can be different depending on the operating system, which is a great setup for Dorada's lecture on containers next week so that things could be much more reproducible. Um, and also I wanted to point out that uh, it, it is indeed that our team and the field in general is Linux and Mac, Mac centric. We don't have a lot of users that use Windows. Um, and installing shell and Git is much more labor intensive on Windows than it is for Linux or Mac. And we know that some of you had had issues with this and I just wanna point those who have had issues and also those who have solutions to this to the Neurostars forum because there is a thread that's open so that people can discuss uh, using shell and Git on Windows. And so we welcome anyone who has an issue with that to post that, anyone who has uh, solutions that they have discovered that would be helpful for, the, for the, the community. So please post there. So now just uh, to clarify a few of the quiz questions. So for question number four, where we are counting the number of lines that contain the word pattern, um, Many of you have used the W option in grep and to match the pattern of the word pattern. And that uh, the question is ambiguous and it doesn't really uh, clarify what it is, but what the W option does is it matter, it matches the pattern um, pattern exactly, which excludes the, the use of plural patterns. And the way that the question was conceptualized was just to match pattern that is, uh, case insensitive and pattern or patterns plural. And so um, we just wanted to clarify that using the W option in grep is a regular expression that matches that instance exactly, whereas the question was conceptualized more as just generally match matching how many instances of the string pattern are there. Um, and then for question nine, where we are counting the number of lines in the git log after adding a branch, uh, that the answer is actually incorrect. So we, um, and thank you to those who pointed that out. We asked that you um, committed a file to the new branch, and then you checked out the master branch after committing to the new feature branch. And the correct answer is, in, as indicated on the quiz, is actually the number of lines in the Git log if you're still pointing to the new feature branch, not checking out the master branch. And that was my oversight in creating that question. Um, and so thank you to those for pointing that out. And, yeah, so just to clarify those issues, and now I'm going to send it over to Jessica. Thank you, Dustin. Um, yeah, so just paralleling what Dustin said, uh, inevitably we're going to make some mistakes in writing these questions, and we apologize for that. But if anything comes up, send us a message and we will um, make sure to clarify things. Um, before we get started with the question and answers, I would like to just make some general course announcements. Um, first of all, we have some uh, students who are actually putting together a little student-led journal club, and I wanted to promote that here just a little bit. Um, my understanding, this is totally student-led, but my understanding is that it's uh, meant to be a space uh, for students to present 
on research that is either of interest to the course uh, or to ABCD, like reproducibility, open science development, fMRI, et cetera. Um, but it, it can be of other topics too. If you are interested in taking part in that, um, the student who is uh, kind of putting it together posted on the NeuroStars um, channel about it with a doodle poll. So please go and fill that out. You can um, find all of the ABCD Repronym topics on NeuroStars if you go to https dot, uh, slash slash neurostars.org slash C slash ABCD dash Repronym. Um, and I think uh, just in general, that is a great place to ask any questions that you might have for the t uh, about the class if you're an observer student and don't have access to the um, enrolled student Slack um, or just have general conversations about ABCD Repronym related topics there. Um, one other update for enrolled students in the class um, by popular demand, <laughs> we are now allowing multiple attempts on the quizzes that are up on Canvas. It was brought to our attention that it might be good to um, try the quiz out first and then go into your TA Q&A sessions and work on the quiz and then be able to do it again. Um, but again, we're not actually grading for correctness on those quizzes. We are interested in whether or not you did them. We're grading for completion. Um, and we want to know, um, we, we, want, we want you to be able to understand the concepts that are being presented in them. So moving forward from week three on, all those quizzes are going to be um, able to be answered more than once. Um, and one other thing for the enrolled students, I noticed that um, some of you guys have signed up for the TA Q&A sessions. This past week was our first round of those TA Q&A sessions. If you haven't yet signed up for a time that works best for your schedule, please go and do that this week. Um, there's a link to the sign up sheet for enrolled sh students in the email that I sent out last week and the one that, and I'm gonna include it in the email that we're gonna send out for this week. Um, and quiz, quizzes for week three are gonna be available later today and I will include that on the email that will go out this evening. And that's all my general updates for the course. I think maybe now I'll turn it back to the uh, organizers and instructors so we can try and answer some questions. Absolutely. Um, given this time, I think we're going to go ahead and jump right into those questions. And I'm going to be a little bit of a brat and take this first question because I really want to answer it. And that is, um, we had a combination of COVID related questions with it, I think are really important. And so the question is, in the lecture, there were some sub studies such as the IRMA study in addition to the main study. Is there a possibility that a COVID related study will also be included in the sub study? And absolutely, yes, we are actually right now in the midst of data collection on a COVID related substudy. And so for clarification, ABCD was funded with a budget that corresponded to a set series of protocols. And any additional protocols, measures, questionnaires, components, substudies are all something that have to be very carefully considered. Number one, to look at the additional burden that we will be placing on youth and families for their additional participation. We don't want to throw on so many, I mean, it's already a very in intensive study and to throw on additional measures and protocols would perhaps adversely impact our ability to retain those families throughout the entire 10 year study. So these things are all very carefully negotiated. Um, the Irma substudy was one that um, came arose because of Hurricane Irma, obviously. But there is also a mechanism at NSF. You know, the main funder of the study is the National Institutes of Health (NIH). But the NSF has a mechanism for something that they call rapid proposals, and these are fast um, funding mechanisms when there is an emergent something such as a natural disaster, such as a global pandemic, where there is an opportunity to quickly get additional funds to make sure that um, things like uh, uh, participant payments can be, uh, additional compensations can be found and that staff are able to be funded to do these additional components. So long story short, um, very early on in the March closures due to COVID, um, a group of investigators in ABCD reached out to NSF and they submitted a proposal and we did get rapid funding so that the sites could ask additional COVID related questions. Um, 
Susan Tapert and Anthony Dick are leading up that sub study. And um, we're hoping that we can, you know, make sure that those data are pushed out with the data releases as soon as they are available to do so. So obviously I'm excited about that because I think that this is a really excellent opportunity given that we have baseline measures on our youth to fold in additional questions about how this terribly impactful pandemic is uh, influencing the physical and mental health of, of our, our ABCD kids. So the follow up part of that is, do we know if or how the COVID-19 has impacted the ABCD data collection visit structure? Are participants still being able to be scanned every other year or has that cycle been disrupted due to the pandemic? Um, and I did include a brief little mention of this in my week one lecture and, and yeah, it, it absolutely impacted data collection because in March, all of the sites that shut down. So there was a, um, period in which we very quickly moved as much as the behavioral protocols as possible to virtual visits. The MRI portion and the biospecimen um, that was halted. Starting around July, some of the sites were able to open up. At this point, um, 19 of the 21 sites are resuming in-person data collection. Um, and hopefully those last two sites will be uh, approved to resume in, in, in within the next couple of weeks. Now, obviously this impacts the timeline of data collection. Um, the sites are doing everything that they can right now to address the backlog. Um, while also we're, we're also in that tricky point because we're shifting from the year two neuroimaging visits to the year four neuroimaging visits. So not only do we have this big backlog, but now we also have um, the year four, four protocol to implement. So it has been very complicated. Um, we are doing everything that we can to address the backlog and scan as many kids as we can to stay on track, but there will be a COVID related uh, impact on the overall data structure. One of the key issues that we are particularly cognizant of is that these kids are on the cusp of entering puberty. So the biospecimen data is particularly of interest to us right now. Um, so we really want to try to find a way for sites that maybe aren't scanning yet, that we shift personnel to focus on biospecimen collection, um, because those, those are sort of we're at a really critical time for these kids. Um, so very long story short, COVID has had an impact. We are trying to collect additional measures. We're also trying to play catch up on some of the measures that we're missing. And we're going to do the best that we can in, in the time that we have available to us. OK, so. How about we uh, take a question for the deep team? Yeah, perfect. All right, so here's one that is um, can you provide more information about the ontology used? In particular, I'm interested in merging the HCP elements, elements and structures with the ABCD elements and structures to see how, how often we have apples and pears mapped to the same bucket. So, so I Should guess I anyone that? has it. Sure. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there are no apples and pears in ABCD. I, I think I checked. Um, uh, so, so the answer is no on that. But if you want to compare it with HCP, um, you have to look at the data dictionaries. So a slight distinction, JB, maybe you can <laughs> talk about this, uh, what, what is the difference between a data dictionary and, a, uh, uh, and an ontology. So <laughs> the, the, the site, if you go to the NIMH data archive, uh, they provide data dictionaries and the data dictionary lists the coding and it lists the uh, specific wording. Um, but those are the only uh, uh, features that you can use to match against the same kind of questions, uh, words, wordings used in the, in the analysis. And I, I think uh, there are better equipped people to chime in here. Uh, what makes a question comparable across instrument, I think. Maybe clear. I, I can I can try. So I, yep. yeah, I was going to say this kind of a it it comes into another question that's been asked about when you see a variable in the data dictionary and it doesn't show up in the deep ontology. And there are 
confusingly, there are often multiple variable names, um, depending on which source you're looking at. So when you look at the data dictionary, you'll see on the far right column, there's a column called aliases, and you'll find alternative variable names there. Um, and it's partly to do with kind of ender requirements, and then also what we thought were easier and more interpretable variable names. So if you, if you can't find something in the data dictionary, or you're trying to link things up between the HCP pipeline and, and this pipeline, then it's important to look at those aliases um, because there may be two different versions of the variable name that you need to look at. Sorry, it can be a bit complicated. And do you have, um, so part of that, the, the question kind of had two parts. One was trying to, how to, how to match different measures. Um, but uh, another one was like, how was the ontology created? Do you have more information about that? So there is a, uh, something that we call an ontology, uh, which is built into deep. And I, I think that's the one that we are talking about right now. Yeah, okay. So let, let's assume that. So there's actually, um, you know, we are leaning out there calling it an ontology um, because there is no owl for it. Um, it's a crude way of organizing um, by domain and by data collection instrument and by some sort of organizational structure. So it's, it's you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't claim that this is a, a real ontology, even though it's, it's written in the, it looks good on, on the application. Um, so the way it was created is if you open that page and you look at the very top, there is actually a button where you can open a secondary window, like a modal window on top. And that lists a very confusing list of uh, lines inside the text editor. So I think everybody can actually see this. Nobody uh, actually knows what it actually is. But if you make a copy of that, that is the way that the data is structured in ABCD. Uh, the, the rows are very simple. They're basically regular expressions with a tag and, um, and the text. And the tag is used as a, as a root node. Um, the regular expression is mapped against everything in ABCD, all the different uh, terms that come from the NMH data archive. So if you have a term that is um, like appears in a different row, then that will be a node that opens up underneath. So there are some leaf nodes that come from real ABCD variables, but everything else is generated through that text file. It's basically just terms with regular expressions attached. The cool thing about this is you can select the term and it matches with a regular expression against the variable name. That means you can have variables that appear in several places in the tree. It's not a unique placement for variables. And you can actually you know, design it. You can say, uh, I have a subtree for imaging that is uh, anatomical based, but you can have another subtree which starts with left and right hemisphere and then goes anatomically. And they can contain the same variables. They can be, they can be represented in the same structure. So it's, I, th I think it's, uh, it's, it's just a way to allow people an easier uh, into the, the very, you know, 65,000 variables. You, you want to have some grouping, but it's by no means something what you would call an ontology, like a, 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 a real one where we have terms that are coming from, uh, you know, uh, common data elements or something like this. It's, it's just, a, uh, just a list of regular expressions that uh, build up uh, uh, a tree that can have loops and can have elements in different places. And we are using this to um, run through all the variables. So there is like a, um, a feature built in where we can check if any variable slips through the cracks. <laughs> and then we, we put it somewhere where we think it should appear. And that's also one of the reasons that the variable could be missing. Can I just throw in one little additional thing there in the lecture by David Peter about semantics, we begin to get into sort of over and above the terms that you run into. Uh, there's the ability to add additional semantics about the different you know, types of questions and the relationships of them. 
that's not been completed for all of ABCD, but you learn about how to uh, apply those kinds of tags to the data that you extract from ABCD or other you know, data sources. So some of that will come back to you know after uh, David Peters' lecture in week five, six, sometime down the road. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions about deep that since we're there, uh, can you further explain the construction of the propensity weights? Chase? Who wants to... Chase? Chase? Chase, Chase, yes. Yeah, I can try Chase. to explain it. Um, yeah. So these propensity weights were developed from the ACS survey for all kids within the same range. Um, the way I understand it is, you know, our, our set of fixed effect variables such as age, race, ethnicity, um, gender, those, those types were used to predict um, um, these different subset of kids. So these, I, I believe it's matched using those covariates to the ACS survey sample. Um, which is the American community survey that basically tells us what is normal for a whole populace in the US. Yeah. I think it's weird. The, the propensity weighting, I think personally is, is a weird thing because it leads to this column that we have that assigns a weight to a participant. And that's kind of, you know, it's like uh, your, this participant is weight is worth like 10,000 and this other one is 20,000. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, so, it's, so I, I think it's, it's a, it's a use, useful thing if you want to make any claims that your results or, or what you'll find similar to other studies which have been done in a nationally represented population. So that's where it's really useful because ABCD is as well as they did in recruitment to try and get it as close to nationally representative. Um, it, it's not exactly there in terms of the proportions of um, white participants versus black participants in, in high income versus low income brackets, right? So it's, it's not exactly representative of the US population. So these propensity weights that they're based on, um, I can put a, a link to the paper, Steve Haringa's paper, um, that kind of outlines it in a lot more detail, but it's based on um, family income, family type, so uh, whether parents are married or as a single parent household, household size, um, the census region, um, where the participants are from, sex, race, and ethnicity. So there's a lot, there's a lot of variables that we have from the American Community Survey. Um, and it's essentially just a, a weighting tool to up weight or down weight how much a participant um, contributes to the statistic you're looking at um, to make that statistic more nationally representative. <clears throat> but I can post, I can post the paper. Yeah. In the it's also, uh, yeah, also a warning. Um, so the calculation was done on all 11,800 whatever participants. So the weights calculated are uh, the weights for analysis that includes everyone. So if you're doing an analysis on a subset, then that might, the weighting might be a little bit different in order to get um, the, the representative numbers for the ACS. Um, Chase, is, isn't there, uh, I mean, we're reporting the ACS weighted values somewhere in the interface already, aren't we? Like the marginal distribution kind of page? I don't think we're actually reporting the weights per se, but um, all the updated statistics and say table one or the parameter estimates will be updated by those weights. Um, yeah, cool. I guess uh, one last point on this is these weights were only calculated at baseline, but um, I believe Steve Haringa is um, for future subsequent years, he will be kind of updating these weights or creating a new set of weights for you know additional time points. All right, thank you. Um, one more deep question. What does it mean when a variable is labeled as corrected or uncorrected? Um, maybe I can handle that. I, I think that's mainly referring to the NIH toolbox scores because I don't think there are many others that have the uncorrected corrected. So I'm gonna assume that. 
Um, so, so essentially within, within the NIH toolbox, um, there's a lot of information online about it. It's, it's used quite widely. And um, the uncorrected scores are just scores that are uh, standardized based on a kind of representative population, but they're not corrected specifically based on whether, based on the participant's age or sex or any other demographics. Um, so the uncorrected are just kind of standardized scores, whereas the corrected version, they're actually kind of weighted based on the demographics of the uh, participant. Yeah, I had a nice uh, um, discussion with uh, Wes at some point. And there was this, so why do we uh, actually provide both of them? And, and one of the answers was that, um, so when they're, when they're corrected, then they're corrected based on some uh, you know, subset of people. And um, with the ABCD study having 1,000 people, that's actually more than the NIH toolbox people used to, to calculate their corrections. So it's, it's kind of your, uh, you, you should correct by ABCD instead of correcting yeah, by I, I, I what the ABC, what the, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I completely which is agree. Funny. I think yeah. we, we generally use the uncorrected scores because then we run our statistical models controlling for age, sex, and demographics. So we control for them within our own models and within ABCD data rather than kind of adjusting them based on this separate sample, which as Hauke says, is actually much smaller and probably less representative than ABCD. Um, so yeah, I would, I would lean towards using the uncorrected scores, but I think the corrected scores are important if you want to compare to other research that has used those same corrected scores from the toolbox. I think that's a really, really important point to make and, and for the students to hear that. So thank you. Thank you both for that one. Um, I'll jump in and say, maybe let's have a repronym question. And so Jarota, this one's for you. In the lectures, bash and shell seem to be used synonymously, but there are different shells, born, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Why is bash the default and what are the pros cons of bash versus other shells? Um, yeah, I actually like, I think I mentioned once that uh, bash is not the only show, but yes, I was using shell mostly because um, bash is default shell in most, I think, Linux, GNU Linux systems distribution and on Mac, uh, Mac OS. I believe also like if you are using some of the kind of like Windows shell is also like the based on bash. So it's true that it's not the only one, but I think it's like, it's definitely the most common. Um, and I think that, you know, and when you are like learning new things, like I, I thought that it would be easier just to focus on one, but also like the, some of these shells are not completely different. So it's like, if you learn Bash, if you really have reason to use other shells, I think many of the things you would be able to, to use it and you know based on uh you know like learn more based on the, what you learn about bash uh i i personally don't have in my work i didn't find any reason to use anything else than bash i don't know if anyone had the reason to use something else maybe i don't know if dustin or yarek had this experience but i've never had reason to to, to switch so Early on, I learned <clears throat> using a TC shell yeah. because a oh, long time ago, um, in installing Afni, they it was a lot. It played a lot better with TC shell, and so I learned on there. Um, but then, when expanding my horizons, I changed over to Bash because it was the most common. Yeah, I had some experience working on uh, on like uh, computers from HPC centers like many years ago that you know, they were using different shells as the default ones. But recently, I have to say that um, everywhere where I log in, I think it's mostly Bash. So that was the reason why I mostly focus on Bash. But yeah, that's true that Bash, it's, uh, Bash is not the only shell, so. Yeah. So talking about um, your lecture, one of the things that comes up both when I'm thinking about uh, questions about Git and what I've heard a lot of people say is that, when should I commit changes to a repository? Should I use, like, what are the best practices? Should I use it as a control S? Should I use it as a file saving function, committing at every save? Or if not, what are the best practices in commit frequency? And what should I include in a commit, like only changes to one file versus changes to multiple files? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I, I'm, 
you know, I think it is a bit like personal style. So I really like telling you about like what I mostly like doing, but I'm, I, I, you know, like observing other people's work. I know that not everyone has the, exactly the same style. So I wouldn't say that you should use it exactly as control S um, because like, uh, you know, like many of also like many tools that you are using actually like, you know, saving things for you actually at this point, like just to that, that you are saved. But I would say that I'm using um, commit quite often whenever, whenever I can describe what I've just done. So if I finish something and I can say what I finish, I think it's a good point to, to commit. It doesn't have to be big. So the change that you are making doesn't have to be big. It's, I think it's enough if you can describe, okay, I, I fixed the issue in this function. Even if it's like one line, I think it's a good place to commit. You know, some of the things are like much bigger and then you would like um, edit more files. And you know, it might be like you need to you need to edit like five different files. But I think as long as this is related to one specific thing, you can keep all changes from all five files within like one commit. So so that's my that's my way of the, like uh, like working. So even for me, there's nothing too small to commit. You know, if something is like I can, it's it it can also like you can think about it. What would be useful for you in two weeks when you read your history, for example? Yeah. So it's often like, you know, I'm fixing some things and I know, like, oh my God, like, it might be that I will, you know, I will have to fix the same thing somewhere else, you know. And it's also like very important for me to make, okay, maybe let's comment this because then reading this history, I will be able to, uh, to find it easy. Another thing is like, you know, um, there are also like times that, you know, I know that uh, I've been fixing something and it just takes hours and I'm still not ready. I think I'm still not ready to commit. But I know that I have to, you know, it's midnight, I have to go to sleep and I know that the next day I'm not able to work on this. So it could be that sometimes even if I haven't finished something, it still might be also a good time for you to, to commit. Not because you finished something, but because some, because you will not remember what you've done when you come back to this in two days. So I think there's no, there's no good rules for this. Uh, as, as long as it goes like one five versus like multiple files again, uh, if, if you are fixing, if you are like working one feature and you have to change multiple files, I would say commit everything, you know, like use one commit for all the changes. But if you are like have like five different changes in five different files and every single file is about something else, I would create like five different commits. Yeah. So that's so I, I, I commit pretty often, not as often as I save it, but I, I, I commit pretty often. I don't know if anyone wants to add. Uh, I, I would. Yeah. Would that's okay? The voice of Yark. Uh, hi. If you turn your video on, we can see you, unless you don't want us to. No, I thought I enabled it, just I was disabled by organizer because I turned it off. I am shy, and uh, now nobody can see me. Uh, maybe for good. Um, so, great answer, and I just want to compliment with a few hints. Um, where even to start? So, committing is your friend. Uh, Commits are your friend. Uh, they, they allow you to be your own peer reviewer of changes. Let's put it this way. Uh, what is my com my practice or practice of many is before committing, like control save, you just kind of to be safe. You save it all the time, right? But commit, uh, if you do git diff right before commit, you see what you've done, right? So you could review what you've done again with fresh eye and then don't disregard commit messages. This is your note. What you've done, like briefly, right? What is accomplished in the first line. And then usually if you look at really good projects, you see description. So you go and kind of reflect on what you've done, why you've done it, what you've done it, and you go kind of peer reviewing your own change 
although it sounds too much, but we are doing research and later on we publish papers and we need to say actually what we've done, right? So you would go back anyway. <laughs> it just, you will have no notes anymore. You will not know why you've done and what you've done. You, you might would know what you've done with commits, right? But without uh, description, you don't know why you did it, uh, what was the rationale. And uh, I started to do more and more comments in the commit messages recently, just because it helps me so much to even before going back, just to distill what, what I was doing and why. Then uh, there is additional great feature staging, right? So when you do git add before you do commit, you stage them for commit. So let's say you're working on many files and you see that oh, it's working now, right? I'm not yet ready to commit, but I know that I fixed something or at least didn't break something, right? So instead of creating commit, you stage your changes and then you work more, right? And then you feel like, okay, uh, something is not working. Uh, what did I change? So I broke it. So you do git diff and it compares to your staged area. So to the moment which you changed, but you didn't commit yet, but it was working. So quite often I work in this mode, like I haven't broken anything, I stage it and then I work more, I break it, oh, git diff, oh man, I made a typo, right? So you minimize the amount of what you need to reflect on to figure out what you broke. So that is really useful. And I want just to uh, complete with a, not quote, I didn't see it up front of my eyes, but recently there was an interview with Junior, who is the maintainer of Git after Linux, Linux developed it, then he gave it to humans, right? And uh, humans started maintaining it and Junior is the active maintainer. And what Junior said as like, what is the greatest feature of Git? Uh, he didn't say it distributed or, you know, all the fancy features. He said it allowed good programmers to look like great programmers. What did he mean is that these kind of features that you could commit and maybe you even could change existing commits before you even give them to other people to review. There is all kinds of functionality to rewrite your history, to condense it maybe. Let's say you have two commits, then you merge them into a single commit with more extensive uh, description. And then when you give it to others, they look at it as like, oh man, he, he or she, they know what, they're doing right because there is really nice change which is not just collection of random commits like safe right they have description they provide description of specific change and then others look at it oh yeah it, it looks great right and i can understand what is going on so to some degree then so it's like for your paper you could go and distill your commits which you haven't pushed yet into smaller number of commits but this is more advanced feature but it allows you to cheat in a sense that later on your materials you committed look great. Okay, I'll stop here. Hopefully it's useful. Thank you, Yarek. So like, I think it's, yeah, it, it, thank you for adding this, but also like um, what kind of like also referring to what, uh, what Yarek said, like, but if you are like just starting, I would just say start from, from like committing whenever you add feature or, or things back, or at least once per day. I would say, like, kind of start from this. And later, as Eric said, like, it's kind of like, it's your friend. We are committing because we want to use the history. So I think, like, sooner or later, maybe after two weeks, you will notice what kind of things were useful for you. you know? Like, what kind of, like, commit messages are useful for you. And probably you will change the way how you commit. The, what kind of messages you are adding and when you are committing. So I think just start from like committing quite often and, and see how it works for you. Thank you. Both of those perspectives are really helpful. I, I feel like a lot of people have a hard time getting started because they're not really sure what the common practice is doing. And I think what, what I always recommend to people is just learn the tools and get started and you're going to change your behavior. You're going to hone it for what is good for you and what is good for your use case. So just exactly. get started. Yeah. So uh, you think we should jump back to a deep question or stay on? Okay, so how about this one? I appreciate the option to download the RDS file for the data releases. 
However, I find that loading the 2.0 release into our studio slows it down and often causes it to crash. Even when I change my settings to allow more memory, I subset, I subset it only into the variables I need, but even doing this is time consuming to get it to load. Am I doing something wrong or is this a common problem? I feel like that this is a little bit of a question about how to maybe subset your data not from the RDS file and from deep itself slash working with very large mem uh, very large files in memory. Yeah, I, I will say that that is a common problem. I know a lot of people have had this issue uh, depending on what computer they're using. I can't really talk about the computer processing part. Maybe someone else can jump in on that. Um, but there is a new feature in the upgrade of Deep now, which allows you to download subsets of variables. So you can go into the um, explore option and into the ontology and you can select the variables you're interested in. And it's essentially like a shopping cart. You can kind of add them to your car and then you can download them. So then doing that, you'll be downloading a much smaller file. Um, I will also add that with the new release that's coming out, I think that they are actually breaking up that RDS file because it is, it's just too, it's just getting way too large. And a lot of that is from the imaging variables. Um, so particularly if you're not in, interested in using all those imaging ROIs, then it's, it's a lot to have to download and open when you just want a subset of them. So I think in the next release, there will be several RDS files um, for different portions of the data, which will make that easier. Yeah. In related question is, uh, why do we care about the RDS file? Uh, which is also, I think, interesting. Uh, because if you use an alternative, like let's say a spreadsheet, then you have to invent all the codings for all the different columns. You know, we have uh, continuous and a lot of categorical variables. And all of this basically gets uh, lost if you're not using the right way to represent the data. So let's say you're storing it in a MySQL database. You basically lose a lot of the information that natively comes with the statistics program like SPSS, like jump, like starter, like R. And that's why we have hold on so long to the RDS file. <laughs> it's basically, it's, uh, it's two weeks of work to manually re rediscover the information that is in the RDS file is really valuable to us. That's why we, we still have it. And uh, I think uh, we, we basically buy laptops with 32 gigabytes of main memory. And, and I think as Claire mentioned, this is over now. <laughs> it's not, not, not even those ones are good enough. So I think the basic problem is really a, represent, a, a useful representation of the data. You, you just don't want to have a, a stupid relational database or um, document database that doesn't know about the statistics features. You, you need the, the correct coding for each of those variables. You need to know what is missing data. You, you need to know if this is not acquired or if this is uh, missing by design. It's, and you, you get this uh, uh, pretty nicely once you have the data in a data frame, but uh, it's just not practical. Yeah. So may, maybe one thing, Claire, you mentioned uh, the you know, imaging variables if you don't care about those. We, we have taken pains to prefix all the variables you know, with the instrument name. So it's very easy to get rid of, you know, it's like 90% of the, of the uh, instruments you, you don't care about and then write out a much smaller RDS file that you can then use for, you know, analyzing toolbox measures or something else. So it's, it's I think downloading the measures that you're interested in is one way, but also, you know, going to a big machine and loading it once, uh, cleaning out uh, a couple of instruments that you know for the next half year, you're not, uh, you're not looking at those. You end up with something that might be still manageable be because it's so nice to be able to <laughs> not have to rediscover codings. Uh, if you look at uh, any kind of statistics uh, scripts, they start with, oh yeah, and read this as a logical. And this column, by the way, should, have 777 to be the same as 999. And it's like, you know, so it's a big waste of time because everybody needs to do this every single time they look at the instrument. RDS is so much nicer. So I, I have a quick question for Claire. You mentioned that um, 
and you might not know the, know the answer, but you mentioned that you think that they're going to be dividing it up into a few different uh, a few different smaller files. I'm wondering, and so on one hand, you have this massive unwieldy RDS file. On the other hand, you can go into deep and you can select hand select a few variables of interest. I'm wondering if it is a plan at all to put together some uh, commonly used variables together, like let's say all of the variables without the imaging measures so that users don't have to construct that by hand similar to how like HCP organizes their imaging data set on Connectome DB or something. Yeah, so, so I, don't, I don't know exactly what the, the final answer is on this because I know there's been a lot of discussions about it, but there was, there was talk about just dividing it up into a, a non-imaging and then an imaging RDS. So we kind of had two separate ones. And then I think there's now been further talk about dividing it up into even smaller categories of from that so for example with the non-imaging data uh, dividing it by domain and having several rds files um the the new the latest release a release 3.0 should be coming out in a few weeks i think um so um but i know there's been um there's been some personnel changes so i don't know whether the rds file will be available immediately at that point but but this is something that they will be doing it in a way that will make it more manageable and be it won't just be dividing it into like part one, part two. It'll be like a meaningful divide. Thank you. Can I jump back to a Dorota question? Uh, it comes from the questions, but it's one I always have myself is how do I integrate changes that have happened on the upstream main branch after I've created my own fork and branch and they get out of sync and uh, have any guidelines to, uh, you yeah. know, when a lot of stuff happens in the main before I want to put my little changes back in. Uh, Did I phrase the question? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, so you were saying that if I have, your repository is not up to date to repository, the main repository? Yeah, say I forked it back in July and you know, made a couple of small changes. I come back now to push it and a lot of stuff has happened on main and okay. I, I want to get my little things back in. Yeah, so uh, so it's often like if you are like working on um, someone else's repository or your institutional repository, you fork to your own GitHub account. And uh, yeah, it's like if the new new changes are um, made to the main repository, it, it is not automatically, you don't see it automatically on your fork. So their way of doing this uh, on GitHub, update, updating your repository. Although I, I honestly like, I would recommend doing this um, on your local laptop. So um, during the lecture, I showed you how to how to create new remote, I believe, and um, you can always use the main repository as an upstream. So. Uh, if you have the main repository upstream, you can always use the command git fetch and later, and that will fetch all the changes from the upstream if you use git fetch upstream. And then you can merge the changes from the upstream to your repository. And I can, I can, I can uh, point you to some like, um, some online uh, explanation. But one thing I, I, I believe that many people do it uh, when they're learning, the, the basic mistake they're doing that they often first start changing the repository. And then when they realize that they're working on the repository that was last updated, like, I don't know, a year ago. So as a kind of like best practice, I would always think that, you know, before you start changing anything, check actually if, if this is up to date first, because that would like save you a lot of time. You know, even if you don't do it right away, you can always like, you know, like merge all the changes, et cetera. But I think this is like, sometimes like it's, many things are much harder if you don't start from the most updated things. So I would always recommend do this fetching merging first and later start your, your, your changes. And once you do it, your changes will be like very easy, um, you'll be able like very easily to create pull requests and make to the main repository. If that's the... Yeah, I think, and that's also, to, yeah. Great. And I can point to, I can, uh, you know, show some that, that is like description to all these comments that I said, but yeah, please always like start from the most updated 
uh, version. That's always helps. Uh, did we want to do the course logistics question before we go? I think we can answer this one really quickly. Will all of our analyses be conducted through DEEP? The answer is no. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had one full week about DEEP, but we are going to be providing other options for everybody moving forward, uh, including a Jupyter Hub for our enrolled students, and we will push out more details about that in the, in the next week or so. Let's see, we've got time for maybe one more question. Does somebody want to jump in with one of the four that we have left? You know what, I'll just say um, there's a question about longitudinal analyses. We do have a full week that we're going to be covering longitudinal analyses. And, and so maybe in the interest of time, we will push that one um, to later on in the course when we when we get to the fact that, yeah, there's going to be quite a lot of longitudinal uh, potential for longitudinal analyses coming up. Um, how about one more? Perhaps Dorota could do this one fairly quickly. I've always thought of Git as a tool whose purpose is sharing code on places like GitHub. Is it normal practice for people to track files locally and never push to remote? I think right now GitHub is very popular. So many people are using GitHub. But I think like uh, many people, like I, I used to use version control system, even for my private projects that I'm not, I don't want to share with anyone. So I think that's completely, it's completely fine. I think that's one of the uh, goal of uh, Git is like tracking your history. So you don't have to share your history. It might be useful even for yourself. But obviously, like, you know, if you want to collaborate, then the GitHub is the place to share. All right, and we do have a little bit more time. So perhaps Claire and Chase, I can't remember. Um, we do have one question perhaps from a statistician's viewpoint. In DEEP, I assume that we can play with many covariates making multiple level regression. Um, are there any resources that our students can use to quickly familiarize themselves with multi-level regression methods? Um. I think probably an easy one is, you know, looking at the actual package that we're using in R, uh, which is the GAM4 package. So if you search, you know, R GAM4 package, there'll be a bunch of documentation about how, you know, the different models are set up and how you can use different nested effects for uh, maybe the different types of models you would want to run. Um, in general, um, I don't have one off the top of my head, um, but I could perhaps get you guys one. Um, so. Yeah, there's a there's a really good um, textbook called Discovering Statistics with R, which is probably quite old now. It's a Andy Field um, from 2012. That that really helped me when I first learned R years ago. Um, but there, there's probably other. I would always say start with a textbook. Personally, I think they're really really useful, and especially if you've got a textbook that's combined it, combining learning about statistics with R code in there. There's some really good ones. Um, Maybe we can try and find someone and email them around. Awesome. We got yelled at last week for being very Python centric. Uh, yeah, we got discussed that. Uh, we sound very R centric uh, today. I don't know if uh, hopefully there's additional uh, versions of things as well as R that could be explored. Can I make one small point on this? I know that I wasn't asked the question, <laughs> but um, one, one of the, the things that I've found with these large data sets is that there's so many different variables, then yeah, you could play all day and make all of your different models, but ultimately you're doing this for a reason. And so I would think about the research question. What is your outcome measure? What are you really trying to think? What are you trying to predict? What are you trying to do? And what variables might go into it above and beyond all of the variables that you have at your disposal? Like try to think about intellectually, what is the factor here that you're trying to build? And then from there, you can follow how to structure the variance partitioning accordingly. And if I may add, just like on, on this side of things, uh, I think the, the, thing, the there was a question about pre registration. And I think that's an excellent, excellent uh, practice. And I would really encourage people to do that. Uh, be mindful that your hypothesis should be independent of, uh, of the data sets and the, the things that you're, you have already explored. So, uh, so as soon as you look at data, be careful that those data can't really be used for proper hypothesis testing uh, framework uh, in the future. 
All right, folks, we are out of time. Um, thanks very much for attending our week two Q&A, and we will see you next week at the same time. Thank you.